It will fall violently. It will be a heap in the field. Vineyards will be planted there. Samaria's stones will be poured down into the valley, but the foundations will be, will be uh, discovered. Well, when did all this happen? It started with Sargon. What a great name, by the way. He was such a mean guy, nobody ever calls their kids Sargon. But wouldn't that be, yeah, that'd be tremendous for a first grader. You know, I'm Bobby, I'm Billy, I am Sargon. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. It really would. I'm sorry, friends, but I actually do think of these things. Uh, wake up in the middle of the night and go, I wonder. And my wife will just say, shut up, go to bed. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, like, you know, wonder about things like, did Adam have a belly button? That's an interesting question. I actually think he did. I decided uh, that God probably saw him and went, he's so cute, and went, coochie. And that, that did. <laughs> my, my wife didn't think it was near that funny at three in the morning, but I, I, thought, I thought it was pretty good. Anyway, uh, back to the story. Uh, Sargon, remember him, took the city in 722 BC. Alexander took it again in 331 BC, and in 120 AD, John Hyrcanus destroyed it, conquered it, unleashing some of the worst slaughter and evil that's ever been seen in the area. You don't want it described. It wasn't found until 1697. It would, by that time, had wholly been converted to vineyards and gardens, just like Hosea and Micah said. The stones of the great city were bothersome to the farmers, so they threw them down the hillside into the valley, just as had been said. The foundations now of the old city have recently been discovered, just as it was said, under the vineyards. This goes on and on and on. The prophecies are many, but perhaps it is, and I'm, I'm skipping over so many here, think of just the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. It's amazing to me, the prophecies concerning Christ. Now, I don't use as many as most do, because I find some to be very vague. Uh, you will find some that people will say, this is a prophecy about Jesus. And I'm going, I'm not sure. You know, when it says things such as crucified between thieves, that's a pretty solid prophecy. Uh, so I, I, I stick with the, the solid ones. And here are the ones that you get out of the Old Testament. Born of the seed of woman, which, by the way, was a fascinating scientific insight. Because until Leonardo da Vinci, nobody thought women had anything to do with what happened to our babies, except incubate them. They didn't think they had a seed. It was all about the guy. It was, this amazes me. It was Leonardo da Vinci who first figured out, wait a minute, when people of two races marry, their children are usually a blend of the color of both. Why didn't people pick up on that one earlier? I don't know. But they all assumed that the seed was all in the man. But God said it will be the seed of woman. And yes, seed of woman. Born of a virgin. By the way, that's technically possible. Uh, people have said, you know, it is possible for a virgin to give birth without man's interference. I said, yeah, I know, it's possible. It's just never been demonstrated that an egg could start breaking in two on its own and just start working its way up and dividing and forming. However, it, the child would be a female. And so that does not explain Jesus. So born of a virgin called the son of God, of the seed of Abraham, son of Isaac, son of Jacob, tribe of Judah. Oh, this is his address, for goodness sake. Family of Jesse, house of David, born at Bethlehem, given gifts at birth by men from other lands. Herod, given gifts, I always love those gifts too. Gold, I can understand. Frankincense, antibiotic, myrrh, myrrh. That's what you want to see at a baby shower. I wonder if they, held, if they held it up and they all went, ooh, like they do at Baby Shower. <laughs> Can't have enough myrrh. Uh, Herod kills the children. He would be called Lord. He would be called Prophet, Priest, Judge, King. I mean, those titles go on and on. He would be anointed of the Holy Spirit. That would be his baptism. Preceded by a prophet. That would be John the Baptist. Would begin ministry in Galilee. Yes, he did. At a wedding, in fact. He would perform miracles, yes, at the wedding, in fact. He would teach in parables. He would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. He'd be rejected by the Jews. He'd be raised from the dead. He would ascend into heaven. He'd be betrayed by a, a friend, sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's pretty exact. Uh, the money would be used for, used for the betrayal would be thrown into the temple and used for the potter's field. That's extremely exact. 
Accused by false witnesses, he would refuse to answer his accusers. He'd be wounded and bruised, smitten, he'd be spat upon, mocked, hands and feet, and feet pierced, crucified with thieves. By the way, the, the um, prophecies concerning crucifixion were made before crucifixion was a common way of killing someone. On and on. Made intercession for his persecutors, if you don't know what that means, meant that he prayed for them, not against them. You know, sometimes it's hard to pray for your enemies, isn't it? Without saying, Lord, smite them. You know, it's hard to say something nice. You know, I'm praying for you. <laughs> you know, <it's> a... <laughs> but, uh, but Jesus made intercession for them. Uh, prophecies, again, rejected by his own people, hated without a cause. His friends would stand afar off, but people closer by would just shake their heads. His clothes would be taken and gambled over. He would suffer thirst. He would be offered gall and vinegar. He would call out, Eli, Eli. He would commit his life to God, but his bones would not be broken. Yet his heart would be broken. His side would be pierced, and there would be darkness over the land. And he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Those are just some of them. Peter Stoner again went to work. He was asked to figure this out. I believe he works at the University of Kansas, but I'm not sure. Uh, they, he was asked to figure this one out. What are the odds? And he could not figure the odds because there was just too many variables. It was too big. So he said, choose any eight of the prophecies. Take any eight, and it is 10 to the 17th power that this would happen by chance. And then, because some of us are not mathematically inclined, we said, that's too big, too many zeros. Tell us a practical way to figure this out. And he figured it out. He said, cover Texas with silver dollars. If you don't know how big Texas is, if you leave Dallas and head toward Los Angeles, when you get to the edge of Texas, you're halfway. It's a big state. To cover it with silver dollars two feet deep, Mark one of them. Blindfold a man and drop him at random in the state. The odds that he will, without moving, bend down and pick up the right one is 10 to the 17th power. And that's only eight of the prophecies. We have a lot more than eight. We have somewhere between 40 and 100, according to who's doing the counting and what's being included. And yet they all came true. Absolutely true. It wasn't 29 and a half pieces of silver. It was absolutely nailed. Well, what about some other things? Well, science is all through the Bible. For example, as we discussed the other day, the Bible is round. In Proverbs 8, 27, he inscribed a circle of the earth. We also see Isaiah 40 and verse 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. It's a circle. Remember, people didn't know that before. But God says it is. How about the earth turning? In Job 38, and you, this one it helps if you know Hebrew, but verses 12 through 14, the Bible talks about the world ch earth changing. And the word changing literally means change by turning. And it's a daily turning. The rotation of the earth is even mentioned in Scripture. How about Job 26, 7? He hangs the earth upon nothing. I love that one. Because that one makes no sense if you're not a scientific culture. It doesn't make a lot of sense if you are scientific because most people don't know physics. But there it is. It's spinning. It's up there on nothing. How about the, uh, how, how big is the universe? We're just now beginning to figure out that the universe may not be finite. That it may actually be moving out, getting bigger in some places, even while it collapses in others. Well, Genesis 1.8, and God called the expanse heavens. The expanse. The word there means the continual spreading. It doesn't mean just space. It means that which is still growing larger. God knew it in Genesis 1.8. It's also in Jeremiah 31.37. He says, If the heavens can be measured, I will cast off all the offspring of Israel. That's his way of saying you can't measure it. Why can't you measure it? It's a moving target. It's rather like your children's feet trying to buy shoes for them. It's a moving target. My son is so proud that he can now wear my shoes. And it won't be long before he can fill them too. And I'm happy about that. How about the stars being innumerable? Jeremiah 33, 22. 
You cannot count the stars as the stars of heaven cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be measured. It might be interesting to know that in 150 BC, which was over 1,000, over 1,200, uh, let's see, 1,350 years after the time of Job, over that, Hipparchus, who was a, a Greek philosopher, said, yes, you can count them, and there are less than 3,000. Ptolemy, in 150 AD, and everybody knows Ptolemy, I mean, big, looks like Ptolemy, but they, they didn't use the P. I, I don't know why it was there, decoration, I guess. But uh, Ptolemy, who everyone who knows mathematics knows him, uh, said that there were about a thousand. Then you have Galileo, who for the first time in 1608 said there are so many they cannot be counted. We now know, not only can you not count them, the number's changing. Some are going away, others are coming. And then what about, we just figured out what one time the entire earth was underwater. We can know that because we can get seashells on top of Everest. And because clams don't travel that well, that must have been there at one time in situ. Uh, I was just told by a lady that she has a fossilized shell from Texas. Uh, yeah, you can find them in Iowa. You can find them in the Canadian Rockies. Why? Well, the water, there was water everywhere at one time, science says. So did God in Genesis 1. So does God in Psalm 104, verses 6 through 9. Whenever you go into the ocean, you don't just go straight. If you're going in a, in a ship, you follow the currents. Uh, Scotland is at the same height on the globe as Moscow. And yet Scotland doesn't have the fierce evil winters that Moscow has. Why is that? Because the sea that wraps around it, that Gulf Stream comes up and wraps around it. And it takes care of us. You have worse winters than Scotland does. Uh, of course, their summers are about like this. Uh, the summer in Scotland is lovely. Last year it was on a Tuesday. You know, it's, it's a very... <laughs> it's, it's a brief thing. And I have a feeling I'm going to be running into that again in Michigan. So, uh, you know... Has anyone here lived long enough to find a summer? Uh, in Psalm 8, verse 8, the scripture says that he makes everything to move in the paths of the sea. And the reason we know where the paths are in the sea now is because this was read to Matthew Fontaine Mari, who is the father of oceanography, as he was sick. And he said, if I live, I want to find those paths. And he did. Once again, the scripture knew the science before we knew the science. We talked about this the other day, and some of you were a little surprised about this, so I'm, I'll tell you where it is. And that's about thunderstorms. In Job 37, 16, do you know the balancing of the clouds? We're going to do three scriptures. Job 38, 37, who can number the clouds by wisdom? 36, 29, who can understand the spreading of the clouds? You put them all together, the clouds are intentional, they are spread intentionally, they are numbered and balanced. Well, in 1860, a guy by the name of Christophe Ballot, looks like Ballot, but Ballot, uh, formulated his law on the relationship between pressure and wind. Going from there, 1930, we began to use aircraft and weather balloons to measure some of this stuff. 1950, we found that there's a high electrical energy flow upward from the top of a thunderstorm into the ionosphere. A thundercloud was shown to be like a vacuum, uh, this is making it way too simplistic, but a vacuum sucking up the amperage that doesn't need to be on this planet or it will kill us. And yet, we didn't know about any of this until this last century. And Job said, it's all balanced. The clouds are balanced. It's taken care of. And in fact, the ionosphere discharges a current of 1,800 amps to the earth over the whole globe continuously. The, the storms are balanced. Interesting stuff. And God had it first. Well, people will say, but, but aren't there mistakes in Scripture? Well, every time people think that there are, they have to then back up and say, you know, we made a boo-boo. Uh, like Abraham. They will say, Abraham couldn't have worked. They said, um, Ur, moving from Ur, which has to be one of the great names for a city. You can almost see the meeting, can't you? What shall we name it? Er... 